You said one of the stokes there. Oh, up front. I got you. Front of the shop. I think that'd be doing good. So, John, we're just waiting for, for Meg or Hazel and Sawyer. Yep. It, it could be that they're. Is Todd Dalton on? He's not yet. It could be that he's participating via Microsoft Teams. If that's the case, we're going to switch over and go to that from here. Because it's almost time. I'm surprised Meg and him are already Let's go ahead and go over to that one last minute. There it is. So you just go to your email. It should be one I just sent you. Quick check your email again. Should be lit up by here by now. Yeah, that might That's be the good. 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 Todd, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Can you hear us? Yes. We're just, I guess we're waiting on Meg or uh, Hazel and Sawyer right now. This is Meg. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were Patty Stokes. <laughs> uh, do you guys have the ability to see me or should I leave my video off? We don't see you yet. Uh, we do have the ability. You, you don't need it. Uh, we, we definitely want to share our screen so you can see the slides, now, but you now don't. Now we see you. Okay. <laughs> I won't stay on very long so we can save the broadband, but um, I just thought I'd okay. get out here so you can I'm see gonna, my mugshot. I'm going to call the uh, May 17th 
Town of Stoke still special water meeting to order. Meg Roberts with Hazen and Sawyer, and I don't know who else might be participating on your part, Meg. Uh, well, I will uh, do the introduction, so I've got a slide for that if, if we want to just proceed, or do we have some other things to talk about first? Okay. No, we're ready. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, let me share my screen. I'll turn my video off. Hold on a second. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Uh, I've got one question. Uh, I think Todd and Randy and Patty are, are participating via Zoom. Is that is that correct, Todd? Are y'all on Zoom? Yes, we are. Okay. Todd, Me Meg is on uh, Microsoft Teams, so I've sent you and Randy and Patty uh, an email to the link where y'all could get on the Microsoft Teams meeting, and that way you'd be able to see Meg's presentation. Right now, you'll just be able to hear her, but you wouldn't see that presentation. Okay, so. that sounds good to me. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Meg. Where is she? Where is she? Okay. All right. Uh, well, welcome everybody. We are talking about the the master plan for uh, the town of Stokesdale today, tonight, um, and specifically, we're talking about the capital improvements plan. And so we'll kind of review um, the previous parts to this master plan. But before we do that, we'll just quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Meg Roberts. I'm the project manager for this master plan. Uh, Jeff Crookshanks on the line uh, as the project director. Chris Evans did a lot of the project engineering work. And uh, so did Aaron Babson. He's also on the line today. Um, and I think you all have met before at one point or another. So we'll just dive right into this. And um, I think we only have about a half an hour worth of slides to walk you through the steps of how we develop these uh, capital improvements. And um, so there will be plenty of time for questions. Um, but let me just cruise on through and, and, um, and get the information in front of you. So first, let's just refresh what was in this task for this project, uh, task three to develop the CIP. Uh, we wanted to, what we needed to do for this task was to use the hydraulic model developed for the town to identify deficiencies that might occur in the future with uh, additional demand and test improvements with the model by simulating those conditions. Um, so and we needed side? to um, summarize what those improvements entail and present alternatives <laughs> and make recommendations. So that's what we're going to do as uh, during our meeting tonight. And all of these slides will be provided to you after um, we're, we're done tonight. So no worries about taking any uh, detailed notes on any of these numbers. They're all in the slide deck for your review. So previously Meg, in this- Meg, can I okay. make a request? This is Derek. Uh, we're sure. getting some feedback uh, from somebody. If, if anybody's not speaking, would they, would they be okay muting their uh, screens? Just wanted to ask that if that's possible. I oh, think George like... McClellan from Oak Ridge uh, zoomed in, so it may have been his interference. Okay. I don't even know where he was. Okay. Go ahead, Megan. Okay. All right. Yeah, you you all just uh, chime in if if you need to need me to stop or or continue. I can't see you, so you'll have to <laughs> just give me the heads up. Uh, I see we have one more person joined, so I'll just uh, recap real quick here. We're doing test three of the master plan where we develop the CIPs, and these are the steps we need to take to do that and what we'll be talking about tonight. But just as a refresher, we did a, in a pr prior part of this project, test two, uh, we projected demand growth, water demand growth. Um, so I'm not going to go through these in detail. We talked about uh, them at a previous meeting, but uh, the projected, the Average day demand proje is projected to grow by about 0.3 million gallons per day for a total of about 0.4 million gallons per day uh, by our build out year, which we're calling 2060 at this for this study. So what's going to happen at 2060 build out? 
Well, we have lots of things that, that we want to stage improvements for. Obviously, we don't need to put everything in now that might develop in 2060. Um, we have, so what we've done is create this map to help walk through the CIPs as they are needed based on demand. Um, so we have a few improvements that we're calling the as soon as possible improvements. Those address existing deficiencies in uh, needed fire flow throughout the system. And that includes some of the things we talked about late last year from task one. Um, so those pipes and this map will be provided to you in a nice big format where you can check, check them out. Um, but those pipes are shown in purple, the as soon as possible improvements. And one of them is over here, for example. I'm, I'm going to have a slide on that. Hey, hey George. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, this is Derek. How are you, sir? Can I'm I, doing fine. I can't hear anything. Uh, okay. Can, can, you, can you hear anything at all, or are you just, is the volume low? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, George, what is your email? Email is george at mcclellanfinancial.com. Financial.com. I mean, I can always come back and watch it tomorrow. Well, th there's another link that uh, Hazen and Sawyer's on uh, Microsoft Teams. So, <clears throat> essentially, what that means is this Zoom link that you're not on. None of us are are, are on that link right now. Uh, so I acknowledge that that's that's an issue for you. But okay. But we're hearing a lot of feedback on your end. Uh, okay. Well, I'm at I'm at I'm at Bistro 150. That may be part of that. Well, have a have a beer uh, have a beer for me, man. Uh, <laughs> well, why don't I I can just call in. To, I can just go on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Okay. Okay, that'll work just great. And once again, I I apologize for interrupting the meeting. No, you're you're, you're fine. Okay, go ahead, Meg. Meg, can you hear us? Yes. Sorry about that. No problem. I know the technical difficulties uh, getting everybody together virtually. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so back back to the the uh, the idea of a master plan to plan, uh, you know, for far out in the future when when we have a, a lot more water demand and we want to uh, expand the the water distribution system as uh, much as, as would be reasonable based on the land available. Um, so the way we've broken this out is by um, improvements that should be done as soon as possible to address existing deficiencies, and then some near and midterm improvements uh, to accommodate the growth around Stokesdale uh, as it expands. And um, we phase those accordingly. So as the properties that are expected to develop sooner, we had those as near term, and as you go out, we call them mid or medium term, and finally, uh, long term improvements. So let's just walk through those. But before we do get into the details of those, there is something to keep in mind. We have to make sure that the demand that uh, we project will be seen in Stokesdale by that build out year can be met. Right now, the existing contract limit that the town has with Winston-Salem Forsyth County Utilities is 0 0.3 MGD at this location here on 158. Um, and by our demand projections, uh, the town will likely exceed that limit somewhere in the next um, eight uh, years or so by 2028. So uh, the question is where will that additional water come from to meet the demand? Well, there's a couple options and um, this master plan did was not scoped to evaluate all the options, but um, one idea is that you could purchase more through your existing connection or you could alternatively build a redundant connection. And the redundant connection is a good idea and I'm sure many of you recall a time a couple of years ago where um, your main supply line went down temporarily and um, without a redundant supply line, uh, it can become problematic. So that redundant connection is a pretty good idea. And so for this analysis, for, this plan for these planning purposes, we assumed that you had a redundant connection to Winston-Salem 
along Haw River Road um, for this study. And part of the reason we assumed that was because we had looked at this for Winston-Salem um, previously. So we knew some of the hydraulics involved already. We knew what we would recommend um, to improve uh, the fire flows in Stokesdale as well as the water age. Um, so for purposes of this study, we did assume that you had that you would put in a redundant supply via this Haw River Road. Um, and it does have the advantages of uh, improving fire flows in this area, of improving water age and water quality throughout the town. Um, and it does uh, also have the added benefit of getting that extra water that you need into the system. So let's just step through those uh, pipeline improvements that would be needed. We have some near-term improvements to supply projected growth. And I think um, uh, at the test two meeting, um, we talked about these parcels that uh, are either currently under construction or will begin construction within the next 10 years. So those are phased as near-term improvements, these pipes in red. Medium-term improvements to supply proje projected growth are, are shown here with the orange pipes. Um, these uh, midterm growth um, were identified, uh, these parcels in orange here, um, by looking at their developable, developable acreage. And we base that on uh, Gilfoy so, County parcels. Study, we did assume that you had, that you uh, so we did base that on parcel information and DOT information. So that's how we develop these midterm improvements here with the orange pipes. And we did put, um, you'll notice at the top of all these slides, we do have a rough year on these improvements. So near term are thought to be, you know, by the year 2030, that's the next 10 years, and then midterm by 2050, 20 years after that. Uh, but the years are very um, uh, rough estimates. This is more, this is based on the projected growth. So as the water demand increases, uh, these pipes were phased into the capital improvement plan. And last but not least, long-term improvements, this 2060 uh, set of pipes down here. Um, so as you can see, we have bulleted here, uh, additional developments and, and growth are added um, uh, because of this uh, opportunity, uh, due to this opportunity um, created by the Haw River Road connection, you have opportunity to provide more customers in this area. That's all the um, these, some of these developments are, are currently served by a community well, um, and some of them have exceeded their well capacities on several occasions, so this is on the radar. Uh, this may not end up being a long-term improvement. Um, this Haw River Road would need to be put in pretty, pretty soon to accommodate that, uh, but as we talked about a couple slides ago, uh, there will need to be some more supply to the system on a, on a shorter-term basis. Our estimate is, is the year 2028, you might reach that. Uh, 0 0.3 MGD that your current supply limits you to. So uh, installing that redundant connection not only has those benefits of fire flow and water quality and a redundant supply, but it can also give you some flexibility with uh, these potential developments. So let's talk about in the future um, what fire flows you'll need throughout the town. Uh, this map lays them out can see over here in the key, uh, the orange ones are 500 GPM, and we ramp up all the way to the purple dots that are 2,000 gallons per minute. These are the fire flows that uh, we estimate you'll, you'll need based on um, the commercial and residential structures in the area. Um, and these are fire flows at 20 pounds per square inch from the hydrant. Um, so you can see that we do have, we have these color coded here and the idea is where when we after we put in all all these pipes for development and given the existing system where will we need improvements to those fire flows so you may recall from task one where we took the existing system and looked where we needed some um, um, uh, fire flow improvements um, areas one and two were covered under task one remember we uh, sh uh, talked briefly about those as soon as possible improvements we had a couple there um, but these areas three, four, five, six, and seven, there are more uh, systemic deficiencies. So there's uh, some more substantial improvements that would be needed to address these fire flows that can't be met. Uh, 
So here's just a refresher from those ones from task one. Um, there was this replacement uh, or this uh, installation of a six inch pipe um, uh, on South Point Drive here. Um, and uh, also from uh, Deer Path Court, I can't recall where, the, oh, right here, Deer Path Court, here it is. Um, so this six inch pipe will help these uh, of these fire flows here that um, are, are not, uh, they're not quite what we think that you need in this area. Um, it helps them reach that needed fire flow. Maybe. And we assign these as, as soon as possible improvement since they are an existing deficiency. Meg, can I uh, stop you right there for a second? Sure. Uh, we have a uh, subdivision immediately east of that in Meadows. And we went out and checked the uh, fire flows uh, gallons per minute. And the first time we went out, they didn't even measure on the meter, but they, the valves were shut. But when we opened the meters, they were only about 350 to 400 gallons uh, per minute. And so we went back at the fire department and the chiefs on, on, uh, on the call, uh, the rates in uh, Boone Landing have dropped significantly. The one on uh, Oak Level is 700 gallons a minute. The ones on Deer Path are roughly five, 550. So we weren't even getting enough water at the entry point into Boone Meadows uh, to, to serve that neighborhood. And so what Todd was saying, our fire chief was, uh, they're so low that he would recommend that we put black plastic bags over those fire hydrants in uh, Boone Meadows, the new subdivision. Because if we were to use them, one of, you know, like on a uh, mutual aid, the other fire departments in the area hooked up, it could damage our system and possibly uh, damage the uh, fire trucks. And those rates have gone down about 100 gallons per minute uh, over the last year or so at the two points you're showing on Deer Path and uh, Deer Path Court, and we don't know exactly why that's happening, but the two inch line that you had uh, said let's replace with a six inch line would certainly help us a lot. I think when we uh, changed the, close the loop on uh, Lester Road, it increased the fire flow about 85 gallons uh, per minute. Todd, if you wanna say anything on that, you might uh, give her some in, uh, more detailed information than that. Uh, no, the only the only thing that we try to do is is we try to keep a minimum of 20 pounds of static pressure on the, the hydrant uh, through our pump. Um, that way, we, we don't want to overwork Todd that hydrant. Or certainly, hey John. Yeah, Meg, we can hear Todd pretty well. Can, can you hear Todd? Uh, I cannot. Um... I, I see him on our call here. Uh, it looks like he's muted on the computer that is, is using Teams. But um, if you want to just, it, it, he can, if, if it makes it easier, if you want to just repeat his sentiments, then we can do it that way. You want us to? What he's trying to do is hold 20 uh, pounds of pressure or static pressure, I believe. And what we were looking for is a minimum of 600 gallons per minute. And we don't have that in Boone Meadows uh, at Deer Path and Deer Path Court. We're down about 500. And so the numbers going into Boone Meadows drop down to 450 and 300. And so we're just, uh, you know, we don't want to connect. To, well, we couldn't connect a uh, fire truck to a, a hydrant with that low of pressure. Right. And we can't figure out why the rates have dropped uh, roughly 100 gallons per minute over the last year, year and a half? Uh, well, there's a couple possibilities. Um, one is that the, the non-fire flow demand in this area is, is higher than we think it is. Number two is that the pipe diameters in this area are smaller than we think they are. Mm -hmm. Or number three, you could have a restriction like a throttled valve, which is greatly inducing head loss to these areas. So there's a few different possibilities as to why this fire flow is lower than we calculate it should be. According to some of your other studies, that's the highest point elevation-wise in the town of Stokesdale, somewhere about Oak Level and Deer Path, I believe. 
which I don't remember. Right, right. And so when when we put this in the the when we put the hydraulics in, in inputs into this model, like it does know that the elevations, it does know the pipe diameters. Um, it, it is predicting we should get a bit higher here um, uh, on a hot summer day. It says, like for example, here we should be able to get 630 GPM without this six inch in here. Now, are um, you looking at the four inch connection or the two inch? This hydrant here on the six inch right here, this orange dot. Well, I know the line, the line six inch, but the uh, our hydrant itself has two connections, a oh, four inch and a two inch. Well, that does, that's, uh, when we look at these numbers on the map, we are not talking about the flow out of the hydrant. The flow out of the hydrant will have, um, will be much less than what we see on the map here. So that's a question I guess I should have started with. If they're measuring the flow um, coming out of the hydrant, then the, these numbers will not match up to what we're seeing on our screen. Um, okay. When you do it. And that's what we were checking. That's okay. The, how do you yeah. figure your numbers? Well, that is a very good question, and it actually has probably an hour or two long answer, but I can give you the, the short of it, is that we do a two-hydrant flow test where okay. we flow the downstream hydrant and we measure the residual pressure on an upstream hydrant. And the reason we do that is because it tells us the available flow on the water main, not out of the hydrant. Hydrants will always have quite a lot of loss, and most hydrants can never put out more than... 1500 gallons per minute. However, that doesn't mean the pipeline does not have that flow available. The pipeline indeed, uh, if it's a larger pipeline has much more than that available. So what we're trying here to do is identify needs for your distribution system, not for your specific hydrants. So okay. we wanna know if that pipe diameter needs to be bigger, not if you need to flow more than one hydrant for the Okay, Fire Gene Robertson with uh, Yates Construction is here, our water server. I'm going to let him address that because we we opened the meter uh, above or be, before that. Above the one we were testing. And that just dropped the, uh, dropped the yeah, pressure down to three or 400 gallons uh, per minute. She can't hear, Todd. So. No. Yeah. Um, you. Meg, so, can you, can you hear me? Meg. Yes. Okay, this is Gene. Hi, Gene. Yeah, what we've done, when they put the hydrants in service on Boone Meadows, the new subdivision, fire department always goes out, inspects, flows, tags them, gets them ready to go in service. And the flows were extremely low on that area. Uh, going into the new subdivision. The old subdivision, as John said, it has dropped pressure from the old records that they kept when they measured. They used to do them like every other year, I think, and now they do it every five-year rotation. So they tested those. John and I went out and took a look at those. The flows have dropped, uh, be it expansion on the line in, in different districts where we've moved lines out that's caused that. Um, we feel like maybe some of the issue, but I don't know. I don't know that to be true. Um, but our concern is right now they're not flowing enough in that subdivision to even even think about utilizing the hydrants to to fight a fire if they were to have one in that situation. To the new to the new section, um, and we're just trying to figure out you know why we got a pressure drop. Um, we don't have any visual leaks that we can tell. We can't tell, well, I'm assuming by our billing, it doesn't show that we're being billed a lot more than what, we, what we're actually receiving. They're, they're kind of matching up number-wise, so I don't feel like we've got a big loss there. You guys actually done a study one time for so uh, maybe in two or three years back, to find out when we actually had the most loss, which was at night. Uh, but back then, we were, we were doing a lot more flushing than we, than we are now uh, during the summer months. Winter months, we don't do as much, uh, but we just can't well, figure. Go ahead. That's, oh, I was, uh, you did mention a good point. If, if there is flushing going on, that would certainly re reduce your available flow and, and pressure. Uh, but otherwise, I, I think I would check all the valves on the line, make sure those, uh, exercise them, make sure they're fully open. We've done that. And Meg, right there at Oak Level and uh, South, South Point, we had 700 gallons a minute 
And so we were thinking if we took that two inch line out, replaced it with the six inches you recommended, that would help significantly. Yeah, that six inch is definitely gonna boost you up. And, and again, these flows are looking a little different because we're not taking the, the flow from the hydrant, we're taking the flow on the, the line. But you can see that you would get, if you add the six inch, you go from 630 to 890. So the six inch will definitely help. Okay. And so this was one of the recommendations that we had given a while back from uh, the existing system uh, where it needed a couple improvements. So I'm glad you all re remembered this area. And uh, we did put it in your CIP. It does have an identifier and it's listed as a as soon as possible improvement. Okay. Um, so we, for those, remember I said back here that these areas three, four, five, six, and seven, they, they require a bit uh, more significant improvements than what we talked about for, for area one and two. Um, the number one was addressed by some, just some piping updates. And number two is the area we just talked about. So before we recommended any um, immediate improvements for areas three, four, five, six, and seven, we wanted to see would these available fire flows be worse in the future when you have future demand on those pipes. So before we plowed ahead into recommending some improvements for them, we used the model put in the future demand to see what those fire flows look like in the future. Um, so area four and, and one little, that's area four over here, and one little spot in area seven do remain deficient. Um, while the rest of those fire flows that we showed a little bit ago um, are cleared up because we've added all this new pipe for future growth. Um, so we only have these two spots left here in the future that would still have deficient fire flows which is good news. Um, so we wanted to tackle those. Uh, what can we do to improve this area four and, and one spot in area seven? Um, and so our, uh, we did some an, an alternatives analysis to figure out what would be uh, the best approach here. Um, and so in our capital improvement plan here, we've, we've laid these out by number. Um, this one here, uh, in this 9001, improves those deficient fire flows at countryside village retirement community. Um, it's replacing an existing uh, leg of six inch pipe with eight inch. So this needs an upsize to get those flows up there. Um, and then 9002 is replacing the eight inch from, from the tank uh, all the way to this intersection with 12 inch pipe. And last but not least, a little leg down here uh, for placing six inch with eight inch to make sure we get that deficient fire flow in this area. So we put these as um, as soon as possible improvements because they do address the existing deficiencies in fire flows. Uh, but we were sure to size them so that in the future, when you have more demand in the area, there's still large enough pipes to uh, make sure you have your needed fire flow is met in the future. And so here's a uh, hold, like hold on, Meg. We got a question. Oh, sure thing. Hey, Meg. Th this is just a quick question. This is Derek. Uh, for CIP uh, number nine zero zero two, if we were to move forward with the, uh, the 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 pipe down Hall River Road, would that be as critical uh, now, or as critical with that extra? It would, and um, you know, here's this map kind of shows it. So if we if we don't put the, those purple pipes I was just showing in, these dark red dots in this area, those represent fire flows that are still lower than what you need in this area. And that includes the Haw River connection. And so this is just, you know, and you can kind of see it from the map, right? Like you, you have this additional flow down here from Haw River, but these are awfully far from it. And the pipes are, are just a bit too small to get that needed fire flow through this stint right here. Where's that area at, Meg? This is along, culp. yeah, it's down near Culp. It's it's east. It's uh, east of the tank down 158. So it and, and just for everybody's information, Culp uses about 20,000 gallons a day. Countryside uses about 3,500. So between them, they're using almost 25% of our daily water supply. So that's why uh, there's probably a shortage. Uh, that's a heck right. of a lot of water. And and they do need um, higher fire flows than, you know, a, a small residential home would need. So um, that's why these Im improvements are, are uh, critical to um, 
currently uh, to address those deficient fire flows. And so if you, uh, if we look into the future, our crystal ball again, where we have all the, the pipes that, that um, will help provide that future demand. And we put in our, our improvements that we just looked at, um, these ASAP improvements. Uh, you can see that all of our, our dots in this area <coughs> are, are bl blue and dark blue, which is good. Um, it means that there's plenty of available fire flow for CULP and the um, uh, other hydrants along this line. Let's shift gears a little bit into water quality. I know that's definitely a, a hot topic. Um, so we looked from task one, uh, when we were looking at just the existing system, at what the water age was. So water age is a surrogate for water quality. Uh, the longer the water resides in the pipes, um, the more time that the chlorine uh, that they use to disinfect the water with has to degrade and um, you lose that disinfectant residual. Uh, and there's just more biological and chemical reaction time uh, for those uh, to be if you have more water age. Um, so you can uh, we talked you know a while ago about that gives you more time for chlorine loss, but also more time for disinfection byproduct formation. So the idea is the lower we can keep the water age, the better. Now for a, a chlorine uh, for a system that's on free chlorine, which Winston Salem is and subsequently Stokesdale is. Uh, ideally, you'd like to keep your water age, um, rule of thumb, about five days, uh, but you all do pretty well at about seven days, as you can tell from looking at this picture. Most of the time, you don't have uh, too much problem with your chlorine residual. You do have a booster station at your supply point here, so that helps, uh, but we'd like to keep that age lower, and so you can see you are higher than seven days in, in a lot of the system, even though you receive it at just under seven days from Winston. And um, a problem we pointed out from mm -hmm. task one also is the storage tank. So storage tanks are tricky. Um, a lot of water sits in there and it doesn't all come out in one day. Um, it comes out uh, at the rate at which the tank is turned over, meaning how, how the water uh, goes up and down inside that tank helps to dictate that water age. And you all are at the mercy of Winston-Salem. So you don't have a lot of good ways to turn that water in that tank over. Um, so we had some recommendations from task one that helps you reduce that tank water age uh, to 11.5 days. Can I, can I interrupt you again? Yes. And I'm gonna get Gene to address this. Uh, Winston-Salem at our vault, we had a bad uh, meter, uh, I think it was a six inch meter. Or was it? It was the it was the three they took the three and six out and replaced it with a new high flow four is what they put in. Okay, so we were using just a three three inch and the three uh, inch and then a when the demand on. called then it would open up the second meter. So by putting that four inch meter in the new one, wouldn't that help us a little bit on our pressure? I mean on our uh, 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 velocity of flow, or not velocity of flow, but the gallons mm. per minute. If it's going through a four instead of a three, well, the the different size meter should help you more accurately measure the flow. But the flow is what the flow is. Uh, whatever your customers demand, that is what will come through that meter. Okay, Meg, that that raises a point I want to ask you about. We're talking about putting in eighty some hundred foot of twelve inch line up one fifty eight to serve the cup in. With that being said, we're feeding twelve into the vault. We're feeding through a four inch meter out to an eight. We're gonna bring it into Stokesdale and that 12 on this end is going to help us as far as volume. Um, uh, the 12 that we just talked about on 158 by the tank? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, so that is going, what that larger pipe is going to do is if you have a fire on the east side of town there, it's going to reduce the amount of energy you lose between the tank and that fire. When you have that small diameter pipe, there's just a lot of head loss. There's a lot of friction loss through that pipe and you then it, it, enable, it prevents you from getting the flow you need at those hydrants on the east side. Right. The reason for my questioning on that, we've done that same thing on Highway 68. I've had several people that want, ask me why we went from an eight to a 12 to pick the volume up through there. Uh, it really didn't, really didn't make sense to them. 
I, I already knew what your answer was going to be, and I agree with what you're saying. It's more of a volume than it is the pressure. Pressure is what it is, especially when we're running off the tank. Uh, the elevation of the tank, I think it's, oh, what is it, uh, like 2.5 pounds per foot or something? Yeah, yeah, uh, 2.31 uh, pounds per foot. That's right. So um, you're, the top of the water level in the tank is going to set the pressure throughout your system. Correct. Um, that's one of its purposes is to help mitigate that pressure without having to do fancy things with pumps. Um, it's, uh, you know, tanks serve a lot of purposes, but that's one of them. But the 12 inch line is definitely a capacity issue. Um, if you need to get more flow with less energy loss to any parts of your system, you need bigger pipe. Okay. Um, so okay. Thanks. We didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no problem. No problem. That's a very good question. A very good point. So, um, and, and I should have mentioned, you know, when we do size the improvements for the future, you know, you'll notice in the, some of these maps I'm showing, I had put in a, a bunch of, of new pipes. So here you go. You can see all these new pipes added around the system. When we add them to the model, we size them such that they will not have uh, too much energy loss in them. We don't want them to lose head as the flow goes through them. So they are sized appropriately to meet these fire flow demands and the customer demands. And we changed our uh, minimum water uh, line size to eight inch last year, except for at the end of a cul-de-sac, which goes down to two. So that'll help us some, go from a six to an eight. Ah, uh, yes, yes. And and I believe uh, you, you may know that Winston has that same policy. They don't, they don't put anything smaller than an eight inch if it's a new pipe. Right. Um, so uh, anyway, let's, let's go back to water age here. So, you, you know, you all have experienced some, um, some uh, strife over the years of, about uh, keeping chlorine residual in your system. I think it's definitely been better lately, um, but uh, this is why uh, the water is pretty old by the time it gets to you because Winston-Salem's treatment plants are, are fairly far away from Stokesdale. But from test one, we did recommend some improvements to get that tank water age down. Um, and I think this slide shows uh, what those were just as a refresher. Um, number one, a control valve um, at your supply point uh, which enables you to open and close it or reduce the amount of flow through it. Um, or in this case, it's a PRV setting. Uh, so I don't want to get into too many details, but when you change the setting, you're able to turn the water in that tank over more. And then, of course, there was these flushers that we recommended. So flushing is super important when you have a system that has fairly low demand for the amount of pipe it has. Um, such as Stokesdale. Now that won't always be the case. As we get into the future, your demand will grow and you'll sort of grow into your pipes. But in the meantime, um, having these flushers in your system will help create demand and reduce the water age. And you can see that uh, by doing this, we get this blue color, which previously stopped here on 158, um, this less than seven days color. We get that into more of your system when we add this control valve and um, these flushers. So, but keep in mind, as the water quality improves, uh, that as the demand increases in the system, the water quality will improve in the system. And eventually these flushers can be phased out when you have enough daily demand uh, from, your, from your regular customers. Okay, so, and this kind of illustrates it even more. When we assume that build out demand in the year 2060, when we have that um, uh, 0.4 million gallons per day, you can see all this nice dark blue pipe. Um, that means your water age is, is less than a week old in all of this parts of the system. And you know the eastern part of the system uh, still has the highest age, but it's definitely improved. Um, so you have the increase in demand. You have the addition of Haw River Road connection here, which is bringing in some fresher water from a different location. Um, you, we have a lot of looped piping that we've installed to create the um, to create pathways of flow for those new customers in the future. Uh, so all of that greatly reduces water age in the system and in the tank. So the tank in the future will be down closer to a week. And um, most of your uh, um, customers out in the system will be below a week too. We also wanted to make sure that we address pressures. Everybody is definitely concerned about pressures. So if you look into the future, we put our crystal ball with our uh, hydraulic model in here, and we put all those demands on there with our proposed pipes, with our proposed CIPs. 
um, we can see the peak hour pressure. Peak hour pressures are generally the lowest pressure that a customer would experience throughout the year. Um, it is not a, a hypothetical number. It is a number that the customers definitely experience. It's during the maximum day demand of the year at the highest demand hour of that day. Um, and industry standards say about 40 PSI is, is pretty darn good. So we want, all, we want to see all these dots to be at least green, if not blue. Um, and you can see that they are. We have green and blue dots. Now we do have a maximum pressure concern. Um, most pipe uh, in your system and in most systems is, is rated at about 150 PSI. So we don't want to exceed that if possible because it'll reduce the lifespan of that pipe. So we did have this one location here on Coldwater Road um, that can get up towards 150 PSI and higher during reduced demands. Um, but this pipe has not been installed yet. This is a future pipe. So to address this problem, uh, this stick of pipe here would just have to have a higher rating than our typical um, rating, uh, 150 PSI rating. If they had 65 customers up there, would that reduce the pressure? Uh, the, the, more, the more demand there is, the lower the pressure would be. But you have to remember that you know, the, the demand varies over the course of the day. So in the middle of the night, even if there's a lot of customers, the demand right. will, may be still fairly high. Okay. And so by our estimate, um, with the demand projections we, we produced uh, as part, in part two of this project, when we put that in the model, we still get a little bit of high pressure here because it's a low elevation spot. But again, because you haven't constructed this pipeline yet, uh, it's a fairly easy fix. We would just make sure that the pipe that we install for this line is rated higher than 150 PSI. Meg, Gene again. I think we've already yep. addressed that. Uh, it's now a standard for Stokedale. We run C900. Oh, great. We no longer use SDR21, which one, gives us a better quality pipe, but a lot, a lot higher pressure uh, capabilities on that pipe. Ah, very good. Okay, good. See, there. Um, that is good to know. But we do... We, we want to make sure you have this map so that in case questions come up, you'll, you'll know where you can expect your pressures. Okay, so that's all the, the fun figures I have for you, all the maps. Um, the stuff that we have uh, after this is more for your reference. I don't, I don't want you to worry too much about each line item because it'll be too difficult to go through on the presentation, but we want to make sure it's in the presentation so that you can see some of the details. Um, so we have done cost estimates for, for all the improvements we just talked about today. We have those as soon as possible improvements. Um, so remember the purple pipes, we talked about those. Uh, those are listed in here. Um, and let's see, I think these, Chris, can you tell me, do these also include our, oh yes, the South Point Drive, the, the immediate improvements and the Northwest side of town, they're also included here. Uh, we have our redundant interconnection with Winston-Salem improvement listed out here um, with cost estimate, diameter, and length. We have, uh, pluck this out separately so you can keep that in, in mind. Does that include a, uh, the vault and the chlorination station? Uh, I don't think we included a chlorination station. It may or may not be needed. You'll need to study that a little further before during the design of the pipeline. Okay. Uh, but it does include a vault for okay. the control valve which we recommended to help uh, control the tank water levels in, in Stokesdale. Okay. Um, then we have our, our short-term improvements to supply growth. So those are the red pipes we looked at a while back. Um, they're all listed here by CIP number. And you'll see on these tables, these numbers do match up to the little numbers on the map. So we are going to send not just these slides, but a, a large PDF map and a hard copy too, if you'd like it for, for, the, for the office where you can match up these numbers from these tables to that map and see where these pipes are. Okay, wait a minute now. Uh, like Dorset Downs, that's a community uh, well system. We wouldn't be involved in uh, that at all. Uh, I think there might be some pieces of that, that drive that would not be on the well system. And, and maybe Aaron can speak to this area. I'm not entirely sure where this is. No. There, there's nothing in Dorset Downs on our water. Uh, and like Angel Purdue Road New Development, that will be paid for by the developer. The same thing with Treevine and, uh, well, Ellisburg Road. We 
uh, that would be connecting from six uh, from Ellisburg in sixty five up to uh, to uh, getting Grove. Yeah. So. And Happy Hill and Cold Water would also be provided, uh, paid for by the developer. So really, nothing on that. Uh, uh, the short term list. Would yeah, we would not have to pay any of those costs that I see. What about you, Gene? Mr. Mayor, that does the so what this includes is the pipe in the public right of way. Um, would this would st would the town be paying for that, or is the developer going to pay all the way back to 158 for? Let's talk like cold water. Yeah, he's going to pay all the way back to uh, 158. Okay, I mean that that's great. Um, what you know, Hill, we what, still haven't decided whether we're going to do that or not. But uh, if he if we do, then he would have to pay that 4,200 uh, feet is 2,000 to his development, and then 2,200 feet internally. And that yeah, that would be excellent for the town. I, I think what's what's noted here, and it's it's important to um make the distinction is that these we were given a list of, of neighborhoods that were coming and sure. so we looked right. at what improvements would be required to the public system to be able to feed these these neighborhoods so identified the pipes and pipe links um i i think it would be beneficial if we could go through these lists um you guys could do it you know as your own exercise mark through the ones you know you think would be developer paid right and then that would form the ultimate cip um, and we, you know we'd be happy to uh, to to pull in and integrate your 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 notes. Um, certainly that on Dorset Downs, I think we we understood that Dorset Downs would be a a, a public water supplied neighborhood. So um, for Ellisboro Road, I think it's important going back to the questions you were asking about Deer Path Court and Boone Meadows neighborhood. Um, we identified that. Yep that pipe from the existing pipe near the, the by right uh, or the new by right location up to Gideon Grove Road to be needed for that additional development um, as it came up Ellisboro Road. It, it sounds like what you're telling me from the, the flow and pressure issues that you're having in Boone Meadows that not only will you need to do the six inch pipe through North Point or, or South Point Drive, um, you really likely might need to do this Ellisboro Road pipe as well uh, to loop that area in um, to fix those flow and, and pressure issues that you're having in that area. As you noted, that is, that is the high point in the system and, and on the last map that Meg shared, um, it showed that as well. So that, that's going to be your, your low pressure point uh, in your water system. Okay. Uh, this is Gene again. One more point on that. A Boone Meadows elected to hook off the backside of Oak Level through South Point Drive when mm -hmm. they put the development in, which we're finding these low flows now. We've got issues with uh, <coughs> the line on Ellisboro Road up to Gideon Grove tying into what they have. Once it's tied in, will be a complete loop system through Boone Meadows, South Point Drive. Deer, uh, uh, Deer Path Court, back out to Oak Level Church Road. The two inch right now that we speak of is a stub line that's serving four homes. Mm -hmm. So if we were to tie in the Ellisboro Road side, could we not leave out this South Point Drive six inch and let it continue to loop all the way through the system like it is now? Potentially, Gene, I don't know that we've looked at that um, scenario, but if that's something that the town would like, we can we can delete that that South Point Drive from the model. We'd basically just close a valve. Um, yeah, because what it's doing it, now, it's doing that very same thing. It's coming past South Point, turning on uh, Deer Path Court, coming down, turning up South Point, and then it's teed off of South Point going into Boone Meadows. Is, so yeah. if we tie in Ellisburg side to Boone Meadows, we're doing the exact same thing. And then all we have then is still those four homes that's on the two inch, uh, which is a dead end leg to service those four homes. And the reason yeah. that got put in there like that, that was an added street later after the system. 
and the developer elected to run a two inch in to feed those four houses off of it. That's why we have that short leg of two inch in there. Yeah, Gene, hydraulically, if you connect that six inch from Ellisboro Road all the way to Deer Path Court, I, I think you're right. I think it would fix your issues. Um, but we, you, know, you would still, you would still have those these four homes about here, right? right so right. I mean, it does make sense to connect it through. It just the more loops you do, the the better with respect to available flow. Right. right. But you're right. This this side of of Deer Path Court would be good if you were connected over here to Ellisburg. Okay. Now, Meg, we had uh, Yates give us a, a ballpark figure on that from Ellisburg down to uh, Gideon Grove. And I think you were showing 378,000, and I think they projected like 158,000. <laughs> well, um, um, there's so definitely some wiggle room in these estimates. We, we actually, I have a slide on what we include in these estimates. We okay. like to err on the high side. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> there won't be too many engineers that are winning construction projects. And, and the, the, the last thing that um, we would want to do is tell you that it was going to be 150000 and Yeah, and it'd be the other uh, way. 400, okay. right? So, okay. I'm sure we can now with the price material yeah. that they jumped up in. Yeah, you're, you're, you're much happier with us if it comes in lower. So. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> now, okay. now that's not to say that we're we would ever be reckless with it. Um, the the environment right now for bidding construction projects is is uh, pretty volatile. So we definitely took that into account um, with just an, an unknown, unknown commodity at this point in time. And there again, now we have to reflect back to that our prices for the materials being installed. And that doesn't include the engineering. Yeah right away easements, uh, thing, things like that that the engineer has to include. So once you put right. that back in. Yeah. yeah. And these numbers would include some of that. Yes. Sure. Okay. So, um, yes, I think Aaron has a, a good idea. Uh, when you when we hand over these slides to you, if you want to go through them with a, with a red pen and, you know, maybe we just add a little footnote here. Uh, costs for short-term improvements are expected to be paid by developers, then we can absolutely add that to the deck here just for reference. Okay. Um, so these medium-term improvements, if you recall a while back, these were the orange pipes. Yeah, they're the ones that kind of encompass a broader area around the town. Uh, so they are all listed here. Um, they, again, have the matching um, capital improvement plan number that will match your map. Um, and there's two slides of this, so I don't want to bore you too much here. Uh, they, they are in here for, for you to check out in detail, though. Um, and they are all listed out with our subtotal for those. These are the, the most expensive of, of the different phases of development because there is a lot of pipe required to expand to those potential areas. Um, and when last but not least... I want to ask a question. Oh, you want to back up to the midterm here? Okay, Derek, I thought I had a question. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, and then last but not least, that, that Meadow Ridge development that might be incorporated at some point, um, we did include a cost for that as well. Um, and I see we do have some footnotes on this one. Right across Marlboro Road. Meg Theron Hooks, can I ask a quick question as we're going through all the way up to 2060 at this slide point? Sure thing. We're, we're building water infrastructure, and you folks are in the total business of not just water, but also the, the other side of the used water. When would a town with these type of schedules start looking since we're locked on three sides, well, all four sides basically as a, as a town? When would you start looking at a cohort sewage system being put in? Hmm. Well, that's a, uh, I'm going to let you tackle that one. <laughs> that, is, that, is a, that is a great question. I, I think, I don't know, I, probably something that uh, a city planner would be better answering. Um, but I, I would say just off the, just off hand that, when you were looking to do a more dense residential plan, um, you know, looking at, at quarter acre lots and, and things that would prohibit uh, septic systems, I think would uh, 
And, you know, so if you're looking to go down on zoning, that would that would uh, that would certainly drive that decision. Uh, or if you had a lot of developers that were lobbying for you for those services, right? Uh, or or a lot of industries that might be lobbying you for those services that you were interested in getting into town. So I, it's a, a likely a bit of the um, chicken and egg type decision. Uh, who who's gonna who, who's going to jump to that uh, to that to those services first? Right. Um, uh, yeah, and, and a lot of the reasoning behind that is Oak Ridge has a shopping center, and they have a, a I'll just call it a packet, a private mm -hmm. packet for that sewage system behind there on a pretty good amount of land to service that facility. And I'm looking at the same thing here. The more people we get, the more demand for different type of issues other than water or, or parallel with water. And so that's something that I think, and I know that you all do get into that somewhat. I don't know the, the, the total involvement that you do. But I think it would be reasonable we being basically cut off on four sides or three at this point with two counties and another town to the east. That's something that I, if we put a lot of credence or a total amount of our efforts in water, that needs to be, in, to me, an engineering factor for sewage coming along because the more people, the more service demand you're gonna have for the various services out here. Because, sure. you know, 10 years from now, you have 35, 40,000 people in this one little area out here you don't have, uh, you may not have the, the sewage to, to cover the, the needs of the people, restaurants, things like that. Yeah, uh, Mr. Oaks, I, I would say that that is, a, that is a different kind of study than what we've done here. Um, right, right. That it right. would include, you know, it would include rate studies, uh, it would include feasibility studies, um, to look at that infrastructure and then total uh, capital improvement costs mm -hmm. for that, and and there there's a lot of factors that would fall into that um, group that we would want to look at, and and if that's something that the town is interested in, I'm happy to um, come down and, and sit with you, work out a scope, and we can uh, make sure that we have the right people at the table to to answer those questions for you. Okay, I appreciate it. One last question for me, uh, Meg. Uh, our uh, allocation right now is 300,000 gallons a minute, uh, I mean a day, and you were projecting by 2028 that we'd be close to that. It's my understanding Winston-Salem has about 5 million excess gallons uh, per day. Yeah. Would you anticipate any issues at all with them being willing to up our allocation? Uh, I don't know if there's any, um, you know, like internal political reasons, but as a supply standpoint, there, I don't think they'd have any problem. And I, I think they would be happy because the more water you buy, the better your water quality is. And they want to see that for you. Plus, they've got significant uh, excess capacity, right? They do. In, in that particular pressure zone, they have plenty of capacity on that side. Okay. And I was looking at a study y'all did for the uh, Water Authority. And based on uh, the max flow uh, study somebody did, it was in one of your reports, there was like 2.2 uh, million gallons, wasn't that right, Derek, at 158? Yeah, I, I can clarify that question. Uh, Meg, this is something, if, if you recall, I called you, I don't know, about two or three weeks ago. And I was trying to determine what the actual capacity in terms of just water, uh, gallons per day that can flow through the current pipe up 158. And uh, yeah. okay. but because I was going online and using some kind of, you know, engineering calculator that I really probably have no business using, and it was getting a, a very high number, but I seem to recall from the October presentation that the number actually was, it just stands out in my mind that it was like 400 or 450,000. Uh, you know, and, and you... I was racking my brain too. I, I, I have, I'm kind of trying to search on my computer while we're talking here. We, we have done a study for Winston to show them how much water they could get up that existing line on 158 without having to upsize it. Um, so I have to pull that number out, but okay. there, 
I do recall that study, that regional study um, about if yeah. Winston were to supply Maybe that area of the county. Dated, if it'll help you, it was dated April 9th, 2018, and it said Hazen Tech Memo, Northwest Guilford County Water Supply Analysis, and it was talking about uh, under Section 3, hydraulic analysis for pipe capacity. Yeah. That's when you yeah. had the 2.23 2, million. You did the study maybe for Wiss's item. Yeah. Uh, what, did, what was the date on it one more time? April 9th, uh, 2018. 18, okay. Um, and I send yeah, you a so copy if you can't find yours. Mm -hmm. I, I think I can dig it up, but I, I, you do have a good point, though. I mean, the, the existing pipeline, like we talked about when, when we were talking about um, the east of, of the tank in, in the town of Stokesdale, when we want to get that water to Culp, um, yeah. you know, that existing 8-inch pipeline, it has limited capacity. It can only get so much there without creating too much head loss. So the same goes for Winston. It has some existing infrastructure. It can only do so much before it's exceeded. But I'm pretty sure... Um, uh, those those numbers are still okay with the amount that you would anticipate buying. Okay. As part of this study, and I'm I'm digging in my documents here to help confirm that. But uh, this is Derek. I've got a question for I think I think the question should be for Aaron. Aaron, are you there? Yes, sir. Hey, how about the Wolf Pack on baseball, man? They're looking good before we get started. <laughs> That's right. They're like coming it. back. Look, <laughs> right. just kind of a top line number that I kind of use in my head, and I could be, uh, I could be, you know, off, obviously. But when, when talking in terms of extending water lines and paying for water lines, I think of the actual pipe itself, and then, of course, I think of fire hydrants. And in my mind, uh, Kind of seventy-five dollars a foot, or, or almost four hundred thousand dollars a mile, comes to my mind. And again, I could be off, because I do acknowledge the price of PVC and, and HD polyethylene is, is is high right now. But assuming that there was just one mile of extension, and when you look at Hall River, there's roughly five miles of extension. Is there just a generic way to? for me in my head to, to kind of assume what the engineering cost of that would be. If I'm assuming the linear foot cost of, of pipe is $75. Is there yeah. a magic formula? <laughs> There's not. It, it, what we would do is go through and look at the, the, the extent of that project. Look at how many um, bores really go into that. So how many, uh, ornamental driveways are going to miss how many roads and, and really, for the main part, it's it's neighborhood accesses that we can't close, so that you know those roads would need to be tunneled under. Um, so that has a bit more engineering uh, in it than than digging a four foot trench and and putting a pipe in it. Um, if it's just cross country, it's pretty easy, right? Uh, when you uh, can put those in. So I, without doing a an extensive analysis of that route. I mean, and just kind of going through memory of driving it many times, um, it'd be hard for me to give you a price. I, I, I will say, you know, there are um, indexes and things online that you can find that that would put um, just a, a standard engineering cost uh, in the, the 12 to 18 percent. So I'll, I'll put you in that 15 percent range of total construction cost. Uh, and then engineering inspections would be uh, in addition to that. Um, but again, that's rule of thumb at best. Sometimes it's going to be lower. Sometimes it'll be higher depending on the complexity of the project. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I also have a question, I think, for Meg. Meg, we've talked about, a, a, you know, a lot of new infrastructure, increasing the pipe size up 158. Uh but I think at the beginning of the meeting, we talked about maybe in 40 or 50 years, assuming Stokesdale grows primarily via residential and not so much industrial, that the, the average use per day would, would increase to roughly, I think, 400,000 gallons. Uh, yes, let's go back there. Mm -hmm. oh, bear with me. Lost you. You can look at my boys for a second there. <laughs> Yeah, I think our demand projection was, here it is. Yeah, average day 
max day almost 0. 0.6. Okay. So so we've talked about the, the potential need uh, up 158 from Blues Creek to increase the diameter of that pipe. We've talked about the potential need for in, in front of countryside to make that a 12 inch pipe. And then we've talked about, you know, definitely Hall River. Uh, in, in any of those, have you taken all that into account in pressure and water flow calculations? Uh, in, I just want to make sure we wouldn't outkick our coverage, in other words, by going too big on the infrastructure. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, so, and I think, you know, I only touched on it briefly because I didn't want to dive too far into the details on, on each of these pipes, but when we are looking at this build-out condition, we are sizing these pipes to make sure it can supply that demand to those areas, um, and that includes when we look at pressure here. That's why I showed you this uh, pressure map here, just to make sure that we are good to go. We looked at that for that build-out condition. You know, we have these new pipes in there. We have our new demand in here, and this is how we, this is part of the process. This is how we size those pipes. They, they are not oversized, not undersized. They are sized just for this prediction here. Okay. Does that make sense? And we check to make sure that our pressures are all good and our water age is not bad. That's why we went through this, this section here. Okay. And, and Meg, as far as what you have, we talk about a hydraulic model. Is that something that you have formulated for us where, you, you know, we can run what if scenarios by you? That is exactly what it is. So okay. uh, we built this as part of an earlier part of the, this project where we constructed the model, we calibrated it, we used it to look at your existing system, and now we've used it to look at your future system. And you are absolutely right. The beauty of this model is that now that you've done all this nice planning, it's great, but it's also ready for you to ask those what if scenarios. So, um, you know, this is a planning project and we've done the planning phase, but going forward, if you want to have another project to, to just, you know, ask those what if questions, it is there and it's ready to do that. Will you go back to the uh, priority list? I sure can. Let's go to, you want to just go to that summary slide here? Yeah. Now, as soon as possible improvements, the ones on 158 and the two or three roads, you yeah. consider that more uh, important than the Hall River connection? If you could only uh, afford to do one at, at the present time, wh which would it be? Um, I, I, I always err on, on the, the, these as soon as possible because they are, if you were to, to have a fire in one of those areas, you would just be kicking yourself in the pants if you hadn't, if you had not done these first. Um, so, you know, it's, it, you're kind of rolling the dice if you don't have the, the capacity to fight those fires. Um, now the Winston-Salem connection, you know, if you don't get that in the ground before your demand is exceeded, you might be able to negotiate more supply from, from Winston through the existing connection. So I'd say it's not quite as critical to get done sooner but it does have a lot of benefits to get that redundant connection in. Yeah. Because uh, again, you have no redundancy right now. So oof, it's, it's, it's a tough call. You, you'd also be kicking yourself in the pants without this redundancy if you have a, a problem with your existing connection. So, I mean, I, I'll let Jeff and Aaron weigh in. Um, you know, I, I definitely err towards the, these fire flow improvements first. Um, they, they do have a smaller price tag on them as well. But I think planning should be made for your redundant connection. It definitely needs to be started. Uh, that's that's my opinion. Uh, Aaron and Jeff, please weigh in if you if you think these are more interchangeable. No, I I agree with you. I think uh, if we'd be we we need to point out existing fire flow deficiencies and tell you what it takes to fix them. I, I think that's probably the most important thing to do first. That's what you design water systems for, and the the Haw River connection. It's not like it's a an existing deficiency. It's more of a building in redundancy kind of thing and setting yourself up to grow in the future. So if, if I had to pick one or the other and I only had so much money, I think I'd put it in the, the first category there as soon as possible improvements. So let me ask you a question then. If you were trying to plan some of that work, how long do you think it would take to do the engineering and uh, 
DOT right away, uh, I guess if we were replacing a line, we'd put it uh, at the same location. So the uh, right away probably wouldn't be an issue. But would it take us three months, six months, a year to get uh, engineering plans and all the approvals we'd need? Give me, can you give me some guesstimate of time? I'll defer that one to Aaron. On, on the high side, I, I, I think a year, um, that's going to fall mostly in the permitting pieces um, and also not knowing if there's any blue line streams in there that would be impacted. Um, but just bu building and permitting with the DOT and Army Corps of Engineers and erosion control, uh, I think you're looking at about a year. Um, there are ways to shorten that, certainly, uh, but we would need to, to look into that. Another another option we didn't talk about, um, and it should be looked at during design. Is you know you can replace that eight inch line with a with a twelve inch pipe. You could also parallel it with a ten inch pipe. So really, you'd be looking at whatever might be more cost effective at the time and uh, and faster for you. Um, but I would I would echo Jeff's sentiment in that. So I would concentrate were... funds. I would concentrate funds on um, existing deficiencies, making sure that your system is uh, as good as it can be prior to uh, prior to pushing through to, to new projects. But so, if you're replacing, let's say, an eight inch with a ten inch or, or whatever, how do you eliminate uh, shutdowns to where you know if it takes six, uh, three months to put a line in or a section of line in to keep the water flow in along 158. Yeah, you'd, you'd certainly have to do that in sections um, and would be something that during design we would we would plan for uh, and we'd put together a construction sequencing to do that. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, there you could go temporary bypass pipe. You can go do a lot of things. I don't think you would want to do that in this area. But, yeah, there are certainly options uh, and it's going to be project dependent. And then uh, as Gene knows, whatever the engineer designs, the contractor is probably going to see a better solution. So, <laughs> <laughs> or, or or a different solution um, that might work better for their processes. So I think, you know, as much as uh, we can plan for it, it's it's best to talk about those sequences during uh, early parts of construction with the contractor, okay. uh, and, and work that out. And would you uh, recommend parallel lines as opposed to replacement? Of bigger lines is is there one better scenario? I mean, from a sequencing standpoint, that works out better, but only because you can completely install that line and then uh, do the switchover or, or tie it in at one point. In that case, both lines would be hot for long, you know, forever, right? So you're maintaining two uh, assets down 158, which makes that a little bit difficult, and and certainly something that should be weighed when when choosing which decision makes the most sense. Um, I, I would not and could not answer that question definitively until there was uh, a, a short study done in the beginning of any design project um, to do a cost analysis between replacement with a 12-inch pipe and uh, installation of a, of a parallel 10. Aaron, this is Derek. The, mm -hmm. I want to keep talking about this 158 suggestion uh, up past Blues Creek. It, what is the importance of that if we do Hall River? So the one, 158, and Meg, I want you to expand on this, but the 158 improvement is just going out toward cult and countryside uh, retirement so that you have some deficient fire flows and pressures, uh, or just is it just flows, Meg, or is it both flow and pressure? Uh, well, it's available fire flow, so it's okay. both. So um, available, available fire flow in that area. You also have um, pipe 9003 uh, goes out to that North Ridge neighborhood. There, there is a constriction in that pipe off of 68 um, that would need to be addressed as well. I think there's some deficient fire flows inside that neighborhood. So those are things that yeah, so the the even with our Haw River Road connection, these are still going to be deficient because of the local piping, essentially. 
Um, you know, you're getting plenty of flow in here to fight these fires down here, but you're losing a lot of head between either this connection or the tank by the time you get here. So that's why this line has to be upside. Okay. And likewise, likewise out east here, um, you know, you're getting plenty of, of flow in. It's just that you're losing the energy to get that flow over to this area at 20 PSI. Okay. Mm -hmm. my, my apologies, because I believe uh, I misunderstood this. I was under the impression that you were... I knew you were talking about one by countryside, uh, but I uh, inferred that we were talking about replacing pipe up 158 past Blues Creek coming into Stokesdale. So uh, no, this is countryside village retirement community. I okay. think it's okay. Here. Cool. Thanks. My bad. Sure. <laughs> Nate, could you possibly solve that problem with some kind of booster station? Uh, if you put a booster station in, you'd still need bigger pipe. You're just going to lose all that that okay. head that you gain through that small pipeline. Okay. Yeah, if, if I could just add the what this pipe is doing is taking advantage of the storage tank that you have. So you've got water in that tank. And if there's a fire, this pipe lets you get the water in the tank to where the fire is without having to build a pipe all the way back to a, the Winston Salem supply. So th this pipe coming right from starting right at the tank and heading you know east is 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 to distribute water for fires like that's the main purpose of it but it also you know helps build a strong loop in your system in the in the middle of your system so that it sets you up to supply new development could you if uh, at the end the past cop at the end of our line on 158 if you put a smaller water tower, would that help? Would that be cheaper? Or would that even, I mean, is that a stupid idea? No, I think I think that an, another tank would be more expensive than this piece of pipe. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, and, a, you know, another a tank does give you a little bit of advantage in that it helps you to maintain this tank a little better when, when you need to take it offline. But it could potentially add to your water age problem in the system and it's it would definitely be more expensive than this stretch of pipe here meg this is gene again i'm gonna i'm gonna add another kink to this we're talking about eight inch 12 inch or possibly parallel we're running parallel with an eight and six down 158 theoretically on athens road it runs from one end to the other to the car wash the only section that's not doubled up would be from Athens and Angels, Angel Pardew back to the tank, and that would take a double loop if we tied those in that would, that's already there with an eight and six coming out down at the car wash, which is right there at, at Countryside at the rest home. Uh, well, if you see those pipes on this map, then we are accounting for those okay. parallel Okay, you've counted uh, for both of them. I just want to make yeah. sure. We're yeah, talking yeah. about running parallels, and I'm like, we've already got one parallel pretty close uh, as you know, as, as you're going at 158, that was my quest. That was my reason why I brought that up. Yeah, if if we, uh, um, I think we have all the the pipes from all the drawings that we received. They should be in this model, and and you might be able to see them on this map here. Although they might be a little too close to overlay, but it is accounting for those existing parallel pipes. Uh, unfortunately, there's just a lot of flow that needs to get this direction um, due to the needed fire flows for that culp and other customers over here. Dan, did you take into consideration that uh, the old Burlington Industries ha has their own water tower down there? That, that wouldn't affect our system, would it? I mean, they've got, they, they're sprinkled, but big building, the 13-acre old Burlington Industries with their water tower. Uh so Meg, that's that's downtown, uh, almost uh, behind the funeral home. If Meg, if, if you help me out. Oh. Okay, I'm just gonna be quiet. <laughs> um, I don't believe that would. I mean, so that that wouldn't affect the retirement center. Uh, I think that that would only serve that single industry. So you you'd still have some deficient fire flows for industry's sake. Um, yeah, usually if it's a, a private tank, they've sized it just to fight fires for that industry. Yeah, and, and it should be behind a uh, 
backflow preventer. Culp also has a water tank. Well, and it is good that those are behind backflow preventers because the water quality in those tanks is probably atrocious and you would not want it in your system. Oh, no. We, well, we <laughs> only use it for fire. Uh, okay. Well, that's just the thing. Um, you know, they can only use it for fire, but when it, uh, if it were to come back out into your pipes, your pipes provide both yeah, portable water for drinking and for fire. Yeah. So that's why they require those backflow preventers on them. I'm just trying to right. think of a cheaper way. Well, the, 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 the tanks that are there now are probably required by their insurance company to, to have sufficient fire protection like inside of their plant. But in addition to that, uh, the, the public water supply system should be able to, to provide additional flow just to protect surrounding structures and to, um, you know, help respond to the fire. So I don't think those, I, I don't think those tanks, those existing tanks that are inside of the, of those properties can help the the problem in the public water system. I've got one more question and I'm through. Only there are a number of uh, community uh, well water systems in the town of Stokesdale. They probably have more customers than we do. Do you all have any experience with towns trying to um, uh, take those from a community well and, and make them public water with like city water is that being done anywhere where they're capturing their customers or do, would they run typically run parallel lines or just run replace new lines or or buy that system and improve it or do you have any idea yeah so, we've seen, we've seen that in other systems um hendersonville comes to mind it's pretty much system specific in other words you need to do a, an inventory of what's there and what kind of pipe it is and how old it is. And sometimes, you know, that pipe would meet the city's standards and they take over or purchase or whatever the agreement is, it becomes part of the city's water systems. In other cases, the what's there and what's in the ground now does not meet uh, city standards, like for example, it doesn't supply fire protection, or right. it's undersized, or it's got a leakage history that they don't want to inherit. So uh, it pretty much is dependent on every on on a particular area that you're looking at or subdivision. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. The only the only thing I would would add to that, Jeff, and I, and I think you're. Um, that was perfect, uh, is that you would need to be really careful about keeping those wells live if you were to take that system on. Um, mixing those source waters could be a, a, a problem within Stokesdale system. You wouldn't want that back into the public water supply, uh, potentially. There need to be a pretty substantial study done just to make sure that that would not be a problem, um, combining that with the, you know, the water you purchased from Winston-Salem. Um, so, and in most cases, we'd likely advise that those systems would be abandoned and then you would accept the right. you know, neighborhood, assuming those pipes and everything that Jeff just said, um, you know, met your standards, et cetera. Okay. Any more questions from, uh, council? And um, I just want to remind everybody that you will have a nice large map that has all this in detail. Um, so you can zoom in and check it out. Thank you. Uh, Meg, will you send up. us a couple more copies of the uh, water maps where you were showing the number of subdivisions and the, that fact that we had 775? We need to send a copy of that to the county commissioners on a uh, request for those. And I think we've only got one or two copies left. So if you would send me another few copies of that, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I think so, Aaron. You is that one of the ones that Brad brought over? It, it, it was. Yeah. So I, I will. Uh, I can bring some of that um, back this way tomorrow afternoon. If you'd That'd like. be great. That'd be great. There's some uh, American. What's the 
American, American Rescue, American Rescue uh, Plan money, and we're trying to get some of that. So we're just trying to document some of this. Great. And, and I feel like, let, let me be clear about tomorrow afternoon. My, my day's going to get pretty long tomorrow. So it, yeah, I'll probably, I'll likely drop it off on uh, Wednesday morning for you. Oh, yeah, in the next few days. That's fine. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for uh, listening and your great questions. And, and I hope this gives you some, some good food for thought. And uh, we'll send over the slides so you can uh, look at them in a little more detail. And uh, we really appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate all the hard work. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank